Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to go over my brother's Frieza Swap deck profile that he took to the Madison Regional event and did very well. I am um, I didn't see how many other Frieza Swap profiles there were um, in the upper parts of the uh, uh, tournament here, you know. But uh, Mikey, uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to show us what you were playing. Yeah, I appreciate it. Deck was a lot of fun. Um, kind of like you said, there weren't a lot of Frieza Swap players in the room. I think I visibly only saw one and he was just because he was seated next to me uh, during the first round. And then I I think someone from my locals who isn't like a super, uh, he doesn't come all that often or at least someone, someone from my locals knows also played Frieza Swap there. So like entirely, I think there might've been only three, maybe four uh, swap players in the entire 124 person pool. Um, so I believe I, I placed the highest, um, which is just, you know, what it is. Uh, I can take a grain of salt though, because uh, <laughs> people, a lot of people don't know what this deck does, but we are going to go over that today. Yeah, absolutely. So um, obviously Frieza Swap, brand new uh, profile, you know, new archetype from set 21. Uh, why did you pick this deck over, you know, because you were going to be playing green Gohan, uh, mm -hmm. like about a week or two before the event. What made you swap yeah. over, uh, over to Frieza? So. We, we, me and my buddy Dane Reichenbach, who was a top eight in this one, who I'm sure people know, uh, he's part of our locals. We do a lot of testing uh, with proxies prior to the physical release of the newer set. So yeah. I actually got a lot of work in with this deck prior to the official release. But once Green Gohan came out, it was, you know, I was like many people who looked forward to that deck. So when it was revealed, I kind of switched over to it. And that's kind of what I had been playing through the physical release of the game. Um, but I always kind of like like this deck because I'm a fan of the swap mechanic. I did play Red Broly Swap, um, but mainly I am a yellow player and being able to do swap shenanigans behind the support that yellow has as a, as a color is fantastic. And I just, you know, the deck does a lot of crazy things. Once you kind of start going card by card um, and reading, you know, certain keywords, certain auto skills and stuff like that, you're like, you know, this deck's really consistent. It does some cool things. And at the end of the day, I knew Green Gohan was going to be abundant in Madison. It's been abundant in every regional that has happened since Wild oh, Surgeons yeah. came out. And I also, I was one of the guys who played uh, Red Sin and Nationals. And that was like fun because I do like that deck. I'm a Sin fan in general, but it became, well, okay, I am playing a good deck, but then I'm also playing into the same thing a ton. And when it came down to like the mirror match, it's just a, you better roll first and hope for the best type scenario. Right. I didn't really want to go through that in Madison. You know, another seven rounds of maybe seeing a bunch of them, maybe half your matchups could end up being Gohan or whatever. So I just didn't want to put myself through that. And once I kind of went back to Frieza, I, I played it at one of the locals, you know, about two weeks before Madison. And I was like, you know, this deck kind of feels good. Uh, you know, maybe not so much into green Gohan. Like, I don't think it's an unwinnable matchup, but it's tough. It's tough for every deck, obviously. Um, but I felt really good against a lot of other decks. So. I went back to Frieza Swap, started kind of grinding it the last two weeks, and something clicked where I just felt better uh, in terms of seeing the lines. I knew mm -hmm. um, just kind of like how to play against certain decks. Everything was just clicking in general. I, like That's just the best way I can put it. It was a general sense of, I feel on top of this deck, and like no matter what sits in front of me, I can think on my feet uh, and plan out how I'm gonna like, you know, attack this opponent. And overall, I just felt confident in it. And so preparation was great. Side deck was great. Everything felt really good leading up to this event. The event went well for the most part. And uh, overall, I am happy with uh, with the decision to play this deck. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, what, what what did you rank at the end of it? Yeah, so <laughs> I'm sure I'll, I'll just end up talking about it, you know, uh, by the end of this, everything that happened. But I did end up going X3, 4-3. I ended up 28th. Um, you know, I I was four and zero oh, uh, the first four rounds, obviously, and uh, kind of ended up going through a little bit of a two game gauntlet against two players, uh, including the guy who went undefeated in Swiss, which is Armando. Shout out to him. And then in my last round, uh, time bit me in the rear end, and unfortunately, I couldn't finish strong, uh, which kind of did cost me top cut. But that's neither here nor there. Um, it was just unfortunate, but overall, a great experience. Awesome. So you think like, you know, given a little bit more time, you could have gotten to 5-2? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, like time rules are what they are. I will never say, I, like at the end of the day, 
I'm at fault. I'm at fault for not playing correctly or fast enough or any of those things that could have cost me some form of time. Um, but like if, if there if there was 10 more seconds, I win this game. If there was half a second, I probably win this game. If there was no time limit at all, I push his face in, I win and nothing's, you know, the different. But obviously right. recent time changes, uh, I think changed from 45 minutes and five overtime to 35 and five. Yep. Correct me if I'm wrong, anybody. But uh, so it is shorter and um, it ended up kind of biting a lot of people, including me um, again. So I uh, just gotta be better next time. And, and hopefully something like this doesn't happen again. Yeah, there you go. Well, you know, I, I feel like, you know, everyone kind of knows what Frieza does. Um, basically, his permit is reduce the cost of all swap, uh, the, the swap cost of your yellow Frieza cards by one yellow, which is really good. Um, basically, making some swaps like free, if not close to free. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to activate main look at the top five, so don't, you don't even need to swing in to activate the uh, uh, look at the top five. Grab a Return of the Army of Terror or a yellow Frieza to your hand, which is absolutely insane when it comes to being able to find a. Uh, robotic repost with your leader ability mm -hmm. which is kind of busted but you know it is what it is um then of course the on the awakened side is frieza the emperor who swore revenge um, you still get the permanent uh, cost reducer and then uh once per turn when you activate swap you draw one and then when one of your yellow frieza cards would swap and an energy cost of three or more attacks, you get to look at the top three cards of your deck to grab a yellow Frieza's army in a combo with the skills negated for the turn. And then you get to place the remaining, of the, uh, remaining cards at the bottom of your deck. So solid. You, It's great aggression, um, great deck. You're, you're searching through your deck a lot quicker. Um, yeah, it's a really good leader. And it does come with a Z leader, which we will see later in the game. Well, later in the video. And uh, let's take a look here at the deck list. Okay. Um, how many cards did you run in this deck? Like 55? Uh, 54 was my final. I had been running it at 56 for the last two weeks up to Madison. And kind of as we got closer, uh, you know, my buddy Dane was like, you should probably cut this down even more. Um, just, I mean, consistency is king, right? This deck can go pretty aggro, but at the same time, you do kind of play back until waiting for your kill turn, which honestly usually was turn five or later. Right. Um, but so we, I did make two cuts. The list changed, I don't want to say a ton, but it changed like enough to, to, to warrant that like, you know, my initial list coming in did change quite a bit, like pretty much the night before. Um, and I, I think this deck honestly could be a 56 card deck somewhere around there and be just fine. Like you, you filter like crazy. You do want to have enough of the freeze archetypes so you're not missing some of the combos later in the game. And there's just a lot of good yellow cards that you really want a main deck to, to help kind of like round out your toolbox. And when it comes to sighting, you don't want to feel uh, not confident in what you're taking in and out because, right. uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that later, but there was a lot of times where after I made the cut down from 56 to 54 that when I would have to sight in five cards, even um, in some matchups, that I really struggled because I didn't want to take out any of the archetype because I felt like it's already slim as it is. And then there was just a lot of good yellow tech cards that I was like, all this like has a purpose in this matchup. And so that also was something that did cost me time. So again, maybe I just need to be better at sighting or just have more of a solid plan for certain matchups going in. But overall, 54 cards is in the main deck. I really promise this deck can run at 56 um, and, and be fairly large just because of how much you can cycle, how much you can search for, the extra card and the top five. Right. Everything grabs everything. Um, and honestly, I think you'd be fine running a bigger deck. Right, I, I, I can see that. All right, well, we'll start this off. Uh, you ran four copies of the Return of the Army of Terror. This is essentially your, uh, it's your searcher, right? Right, this is a, this is the big consistency piece. Obviously the front of the, the leader is an activate main top five. So you can grab any yellow Frieza card or this. And so what's great is that you kind of like, you want to open certain pieces. And then if you don't open it, you want to open this as well to then go and get that piece. Uh, this is awesome because it's a zero, right? Right. Phenomenal. So in terms of, you not only can search for post instantaneously with this deck, but it's online immediately. If you see one of these, okay, you already won there. If you open any of your other yellow extra cards, charge it or use it on the first turn or two, uh, you know, it's live almost immediately. I honestly, quite a few games. I open with one in hand and then grab one immediately off my top five. If there's nothing else like part of the chain that I need early on that I'm missing, I will dump two of these 
immediately. We're focused right. online. I get two really good pieces. You know, maybe I get two different threes, two different fives, what have you. And, uh, and I'm feeling pretty good at this point. Like there's so many still aggro decks where uh, you do want to have repost as soon as possible. And then at the same time, since a lot of the best decks right now are running good counterplays, which yellow is the T-Blow, Mir, uh, Trunk Zeno, and black decks have Super Command Maya, you almost want multiple of those cards. So seeing them, seeing multiple and for certain moments is, is absolutely huge. So again, consistency is key here with uh, getting reposts online on top of the fact that your lead does grab repost uh, with its effect. Right, absolutely. Um, then we hit, ran four copies of Frieza Bitter Scream. This is essentially the start of your swap engine. Yeah, so this card is obviously mandatory four of, you have to see it. Um, the thing is, it's not so much a four of uh, for any other reason besides opening it because there's so many different ways to recur this card that you can, you know, you can charge one, maybe even two, uh, maybe a second one later in the game if you see certain cards, right? But overall, because this can be recurred from um, the drop via, I believe, one of the five costs. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, but mostly, like, you just need to see one or two, and, and then you're solid because you never really lose it, right? Because you're swapping, it's never going to drop. Uh, you just bring it right back to hand. So seeing one is really all you need. Uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, two allows you some more flexible play lines. Right, absolutely. And then the fact that it has deflected barrier, it means it's always going to come on board. It's almost always going to stay on board. And right. the fact that you're and obviously I should probably talk about what it does yeah. <laughs> before, I, before we move on. So I, so when you play it, um, it allows you on play to grab a Frieza card with swap any cost from your Z energy and add it to your hand. And then you can put back into your Z energy any card in your hand. Now, normally, and I'd say probably 90 percent of the time, you are putting back another swap piece because it's one maybe that you've already used the effect of that turn because they are normally limit one. Right. So you don't need it again, or you, you go grab a piece that you need. You rarely ever put a non freeze a swap card back into your Z energy because once you do that, it's gone. And so yep. with how this kind of deck runs, all the non architect cards are still really good cards, right? You're probably not going to throw an overwhelm in there because you like if you see your one or two of overwhelm, you kind of want to keep that. You have a bunch of we'll see some one of uh, type extra cards in here for tech that I, I want to see in matchups and I don't want to lose. So Normally, you do put back a piece with this effect to kind of go back um, and grab it at a later point in the game. Sick. I like it. And the fact that your uh, leader removes the one cost uh, swap cost is essentially is a free yes. cost into three. Yes. So we'll go into the threes next, uh, I'm sure, here on this list. But yeah, so with the reduction, going from the one to the three is always free. And I didn't mean to rhyme there, but <laughs> three is free. And then your threes, the swap costs are, they say two swap five for two yellow, right? So it becomes a one yellow to go from the three to the five. And then the eight cost is only via the Z energy, but we'll get, or Z leader, excuse me, for one, but we'll go into that later. Yep. Uh, speaking of the three costs, you ran three copies of Frieza Cold Hearted Behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, cards nuts, 19K, essentially just a one cost. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's a free going from one to three, 19K body. Uh, talk to me about it. Yeah, so I love this card so much. Um, there was just a lot of decks in this format that will play a good card um, that usually has an impact on the game, uh, especially if you let it like survive from from uh, the first turn is played to the second. And uh, this effect is on play. You can rest mode any card on your opponent's battlefield, not ignore, ignoring barrier. Um, and if it's cost of four or less, it's KO'd. So with that in mind, you know, if you're going against Majin Vegeta, all their good cards are four. So while, you know, you'll have to take the first swing or whatever on their turn, this is a really good uh, removal card if you have a little bit of a crack back on the next turn. Uh, against Pam, the SS4 Goku that they try to play high roll on turn two, you can get rid of it the very next turn. Uh, Trunks Zeno, early on, um, if they don't sequence correctly and they just throw up like one of their blockers thinking like that'll work because like they play the Majin Buzi card, which is a one in one blocker. They play the Gohan blocker, just yep. kind of like a filler card through their early turns. Yep, yep. Um, this allows you to go into this and then get rid of that blocker before you start swinging. So I love this card so much for the removal uh, and just for the utility that it, it adds to a lot of matchups. And then obviously like the three drops are 19Ks. So there's another, there's two other three drops, including one being a TP. 
And then if you saw on the, the awakened side leader, right, it says once per turn, the first time that you would swing with a three or more costed freeze a swap card, you do the look up to the top three combo. So these are always for the most part, 24s at minimum, because early on you have so many freezes, you're never really whiffing on that. Um, and then if you do hit the eight cost, which is a one plus 10K combo, that still is a free combo. So these 19Ks can become 29K swings early. They're going to take that life early on anyway, no matter how big or little you're swinging, because they're not going to give you cards like a good player wouldn't. But late game, when you're swinging these and you can still get that to a 29, uh, your opponent's obviously awakened at 15. And if they if they uh, don't have a super combo, that is three cards to get out of the attack. Or even if they have a super combo, it's still a super plus an extra 5k to get out of the attack if they do if you do combo off the 10k off the top. So the numbers just work really well to put on an uncomfortable amount of pressure without honestly giving up a lot of resources oh absolutely i mean 19k body like you said it's just it's mm -hmm. it's a great number it means they have to at least you know put down uh one card as a combo uh, throw a super combo on there it's just or even uh even just dropping a 5k onto there they're gonna have to drop at least two cards it's it's awesome Right, and because it's a 19K, like offensively, it's still a 15 because your opponent still gives you just the one card to get out of it. But defensively, if they don't have like a point and click removal card, they can't swing with their leader or just a basic 15K and like force me to give them a card back to save it. They have to give me a card to actually swing into it and kill it. So again, for defensive purposes, uh, being anything above a 15K and, and you know, 16 up to 19, uh, is awesome because again, you're, you're forcing them to give you resources if they don't have a card that just says get rid of it on the spot. Right. Um, next, you ran two copies of Frieza Overflowing with Confidence, another three drop. Yeah, this card, is, I like this card a lot. I want to like it more. I thought when everything was first uh, revealed that this was the best three cost that you always want to go into it. Well, with the way the sequencing is, when you play your first three, you activate the, the secondary awakening on the uh, leader, which is uh, when you swap, so just activate swap for the first time, as long as you have two or more energy, you get to pick down a six life, draw two and flip over. And then of course you're on the awakened side, which means that when you swing with this three, you get the extra combo. Well, you're, you, this is not what you wanna open with because if this is your first three and you swing, you can eat your leader auto procs, which means you have to combo one of the top three. And then you resolve this auto, which this card has the same exact auto, which is when this card attacks, move the top three, combo with one of the Frieza army cards, put the rest of the bottom of your deck. Right. So what's why it's, why it's inefficient is if this is the first three you play and swing, yeah, your attack gets big, but that's not what you want because they're taking that life anyway. They're going from eight to seven, seven to six, whatever it is at this point. And you're only charging one Z energy and then the other one's going to the drop. And the whole point is like, you want to keep building Z energy. You want to keep making it big because your, your Z leader needs three. Um, and then you're playing other good yellow card, yellow Z cards, which all for the most part are two Z energy. And if you ever use those, of course, after your Z awaken, that's three minus and then two. So it kind of adds up. So this is a card you want to play as a swing that comes after the first other three cost swing of the turn. So you can get the leader auto to combo Z energy off this three or the TP three that we'll get into later. Right. Or uh, so you do that beforehand and then you want to play this three at a later time in whatever turn it is to swing again and combo up to at least 24 and charge a second Z energy. So this does feel really good late game. Sometimes I did wish I had more of them, uh, but mostly on later turns. And so uh, it was just weird. I think this card's great. It's just unfortunately not the best to open up with. And since you, it's not the most important card to see, it is a two of because we did need to keep this list somewhat tight. Right, and I believe you also run another, oh, uh, you run a promo three drop, is that correct? Yes, I do. Unfortunately, uh, it, I know it's further down in this list. I know we go, so where your mouse is, go down and then one to the right. So we may have to just like trial and error here. So click on that one. Oh, here we go. There. Go, to, go to the next one, go to the next one. There it is, okay. Cool, we found it. And we only showed you the super combos. That's obvious. So yeah. <laughs> here's the three costs, and then we'll go back to the fives here. But this card is awesome because one, it is the only three cost that has deflect, which is fantastic because when you're late game against any good deck, they usually have uh, the counterplay, right? So yeah. if you're in the mirror match, 
uh, they're probably sitting on a cold bloodlust, tyrannical blow. Um, and then if you're playing black, which there's a ton of Trunk Zeno in Madison, that they're waiting on a Super Command Mea. Now that, that card luckily is the way they have to be at four or less life. So before they're at four or less, you can swap into these threes, everything's cool. But if they're at four or less life, this is the one you just have to rely on. So I do have this at three. It used to be at four, but because of the consistency and the fact that swap mechanic just brings the card back to hand, you're never really losing these unless they do KO them on the field or get rid of them in the battle area or someone pitches them from your hand with a skill. So I'm at three here. What this card does is it's a, not only a consistency booster, right? The whole deck's consistent, but this even emphasizes the consistency of the top three, because when this is played, you look at the top five cards of your deck, add any Frieza card, any yellow Frieza card, just like the, the Unawakened side leader, right. uh, and grab it and add it to your hand. If you added a card to hand, you take a card, any card from your hand, and put it on top of your deck. Now, my opening, almost every game, because it's just the best in terms of setting you up for later success, is this is the three that you want to open up. And then uh, you do everything you can to get it, extra card if you need it, drop it, whatever. And then when you play it, awaken. And this is how you also have to get your, your sequencing correctly on your autos. Right. Because when you swap into this for the first time, you need to do your entire leader's auto to secondary awaken. So pick down to six, draw two, and then activate this. So then you can go top five, grab a card, put one back. I always, the high roll is to get the eight drop in hand immediately as well and then put that on top of the deck. So when you swing with this, so this is usually your first, maybe your second swing of the entire game, you're swinging 29K. No one's gonna uh, combo out of it. It like feels good, but like even if it was 15K, they're gonna take it. But the point is you get the eight drop into your Z energy, which then it has a bunch of really cool effects, but it also is like, it just helps you get not only Z energy, but the specific cards you want in your Z energy. So this card's awesome. I'd run it at four if I felt like I had all the room in the world, but we took one out because consistency is key and it, you run smoothly just fine having these um, kind of at this three, three, two split. So this card rocks, it was like $3 and now it's back up to like nine or 10 because people are kind of realizing that this deck is good. Right. And this card is very necessary to make this card, or excuse me, this deck as good as it can be. Right, absolutely. Uh, next up, we have it's three copies five. of yep the three copies of the Super Saiyan Blue, Son Goku, and Golden Frieza Spirit Clash. Okay, do the uh, the other fives come after this? Right, if you want to, you can open those up and we'll just talk yep. about them. <laughs> okay, all right. so all these cards are good, um, very good actually. I would say the the dual name and the waiting to see on the far right are the best. And then obviously you see, I just have a one of the five just because it's like a different tech card. In certain matchups, like specifically, this is one that you would wanna go and grab to help you out of you know certain situations. But for the most part, the other two are just so good that you have to run these high. So um, I run three of the Spirit Clash because this card is a draw card on play and a KO a card through barrier in rest mode on play. Yep. Which is absolutely fantastic. So you can play this two ways. You can swap into it normally from for one yellow from the three to the five. Yep. Or if this card is in your Z energy, you can pay two yellow to play this directly from Z energy, um, which is again, huge. Yellow doesn't have a ton of, again, I call them point and click cards, which are simply like, throw it down, point at the card you want to get rid of, and it's gone. So that type of removal isn't super prevalent in, in, in yellow, uh, especially for cheaper prices, right? Two yellow, I think is still very good for, for you know, in some situations two is a lot, but for two here, this card is fantastic. Uh, it's great in Golden Freeze and other things. Really good card here. This is like the first card that you swap into for a turn. It does feel good to do your leader auto. So you play this and you draw two immediately, uh, which is just, uh, again, feels really good. Uh, What's really snapped about this card in this deck specifically is that while it's just a 20 single strike, uh, no matter if it's an active mode, rest mode, whatever, you can choose to remove this card and you can grab a the one cost freeze up bitter scream from your drop or hand and play it out for free. Oh yeah. And why that's so important is because I'll talk about it later, but the eight drop does something similar, but you only play the one cost from hand. This is the only one that allows you to grab it from drop. So. One of my lines here is if I do have one Frieza, one cost in hand, knowing that I can get this thing back, if I swap into this five and I don't normally leave it on board because it doesn't have uh, protection, 
So like, there's no point in leaving it on board and hoping it survives to then go up into the eight. This is not how I go into the eight. I use the other one with barrier, but I'll swing this card 20. And if I've used my leader ability already, then I will combo the one drop Frieza to make this a 25K swing, right? Which is uncomfortable because they have to give me a super combo plus a card. And then whatever happens with that battle, I'll remove the card from game, play the Frieza that I just comboed because I let it go to drop, play it again and start my chain for free. I go into a three and there's another swing uh, for no energy. So um, I love this card to death. It's so good. Three is probably the right number. Um, four just probably seems too many, but three is awesome here. Going into the, the other five, right? Limit, limitless raw power. It is a 20K, uh, no innate keywords, right? It doesn't have keywords besides swap uh, naturally. But when you swap into this card, if you have three or more energy, um, I believe, actually, no, I think no matter what, when you do play it, you get to rest mode a card through barrier. And then your opponent cannot uh, remove it from your battle area via skill until the end of their next turn. So you get a full turn cycle of this card lasting. If you have three or more energy, this card gains double strike. So in certain matchups, uh, I, honestly, at no point did I really ever feel like this was the best card to play um, over any of the fives because a 20K double doesn't feel that great. And normally you're getting your leader combo off on like a three cost. So normally when you swing this five, it is always a 20 double because you already proc the ability. That's really nothing in today's game, unless it's like on turn one or two, because your opponent has enough cards in hand to get out of it. It's not that great. Specifically, this is a one of because there are some times where your opponent maybe has a barrier battle card on the field that you want to get rid of and it needs to be in rest mode because that's what yellow does. Um, or you want to be able to swing into it. So like Beerus Z battle card in blue and stuff like that. If they don't, you know, they activate the trigger or the, the two cost ability to restand and give a dual attack, but they don't swing a third time because they don't want you to swing into a 10K body, they'll leave it up. Well, my answer to that is, is this specifically for that um, because that card is actually very worrisome in this deck because of the barrier removal. But um, so just the one up there. And then I push this to four. I don't think it needs to be four, but I love this card so much that I want to be able to see multiple of it to play. And then knowing that this could be uh, comboed off the top that I may lose it for that ability to use the energy um, or the drop or whatever. Um, so I played it at four. And what this card does is a barrier blocker. Okay, already good two, two good keywords here. Oh yeah. When it's played, if I have three or more energy against dual attack, another very good keyword. It's second auto is awesome. It is uh, similar to the Shenron champ pack, just not as good. It's, uh, I guess I would consider it what? the the three drop Trunks Jita of this Frieza deck, but instead of resting it, you blank its skill. So it literally is once per turn, when your opponent plays a battle card, choose one of those battle cards and negate its skills. It's worded as if, you know, it's gonna, you expect your opponent to play multiple battle cards at one time. I think it's just worded for that purpose in case that does happen. But regardless, it's basically the once per turn, the first card they play, they proc it. If it can be blanked, it will be blanked. Um, right. So basically on my opening sequence, it's turn one, play the one drop. Don't swap into the two immediately because you want to be able to keep that one on board. If your opponent has removal of some kind early on, I don't want to risk it. Always just play the one drop pass. Turn two, I swap into whichever three that I feel is necessary uh, to start the game. And then um, swing with that, swing leader, and then go into this five drop and I leave it. I do not attack because again, you have two energy. If this does not restand with dual attack. I'm not going to give my opponent the chance to get rid of it. So I do not swing for the most part. Um, you could probably swing because if you went first, then your opponent on two energy has to somehow get rid of a 20 barrier card, which means more than likely they're swinging into it. Yeah, that probably means they're giving you some resources, but you probably don't want to give resources either. And it's just kind of a, a sticky situation where, you know, depending on your opponent, if they're, if they think they're smart, uh, they're, they know they don't want to give you resources, but then there are some players that are like, I don't care about giving you an extra card here. And then it forces a card out of your hand if you decide to, to save it. So. Overall, I don't swing it, but this is usually how I end my first two turns is playing this guy in passing. And then from then on, depending on what your opponent's playing, there's a lot of decks that get screwed up because the first card they want to play each turn, especially, you know, some aggro decks, the first card is usually pretty notable. Like it's something that they want to have impact. So in pan, you know, they can on turn two immediately play the two drop or the four drop S4 Goku that restands activate battle that push your face in because it, this will get blanked or it will be blanked by this card. Right. So they're like forced to combo the monkey off a of leader swing or whatever to proc it 
or play a weenie or something like that. So in general, it forces decks who, who uh, want to have a certain linear curve, play something maybe out of the ordinary, which costs an energy, unless they have a, a cheap free play of some way, uh, to make sure this thing is proc before their other card is proc. Right, right, right. Yeah, this card is absolutely nutty. I've played against you countless times and it's always been a pain in my ass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the point. This is just a card that sits there and my opponents are just like, it gives them one extra thing to worry about. And especially in like a tournament setting where they're thinking about a billion other things on top of like whatever pressure they may be putting on themselves. Uh, they have to make the right decision. And if they forget that this card blanks a card, which has happened and does happen occasionally, uh, they make a mistake, they get pissed, and that kind of spirals from there. So this just adds extra just baggage on an opponent's mind to think about throughout the game. Right. I think one of the last cards in the Frieza swap package is, of course, the 8-drop Golden Frieza yeah. uh, Evolved Emperor. Almost mm -hmm. couldn't read that. Right. This card is also very good. Um, the swap naturally on the, the five cost is two yellow and two generic. So it's four energy. You are never paying that amount to go into the eight. That would be so over cost that even for a boss monster of this caliber in, in today's uh, state of the game. Um, so basically the, the Z leader makes it so uh, you go from the five to the eight uh, for one. So you're never not going into, uh, you're, excuse me, you're never going into the eight without being um, Z away. But right. This card has several different uses. Besides being a boss monster that swings really hard, it is a 30k double strike, dual attack, I believe with deflect, so they can't hit this. Um, and just like that alone is a really good card. Deflect, double dual, 30k, fantastic. The rest of it is a permanent that says when this card is removed from your battle area, it just is put into your Z energy, which is fantastic because that's what the other effects of this card do. Um, the auto, first auto, is when this card um, is played, KO everything on your opponent's side of the board through barrier and rest mode. So it is a board clear. If your opponent kind of tried to go crazy last turn and they failed to kill you, this is a board wipe if you're able to do it, which is fantastic. And then its other effect is an activate main. It's a limit one as well, that if your opponent has two or more energy, that you can remove this card from your Z energy from the game, and then you have to mill the top five cards of your deck, also RFG, which is scary because sometimes you mill nothing at all, and sometimes you mill five really good cards, including a bunch of one ofs, and that feels bad. But this card is another extender for your chain on the turns that you kind of want to go crazy and push. So when you do that, you get to play out the one drop back from hand. And that card's, again, always in hand, unless you do like the weird combo I showed you with the five, but you're always recurring it back. You're never getting rid of all the ones in your hand without a way to recur them. So um, on the turns you're pushing, you know, you're going one to three swing, three to five swing, uh, five to eight swing. Um, and then if you have another eight in your draw, or excuse me, in your Z energy, then you remove it, mill five, play one from your hand again, go up to the three swing. If you have uh, if the extra energy, go to the three to the spirit clash swing, um, then remove it from game, play the one, go back to three swing. So all of a sudden you're looking at one, uh, two, if you're playing the five costs, you can go three swing, go to the eight, four, five swings, back to the three with the extra A, six, Spirit Clash, seven, back to one, back to three is eight. So I'm sorry if that was really quickly, but like, that's just me counting how many times if you have the correct setup, you can swing with like, I don't know, depending on the setup you had before you started tapping energy for the turn. I mean, there's eight swings on uh, like three energy. And if it's turn five, which is normally the kill turn or later, um, you still have two up to potentially defend or just literally continue to, to swing and push your opponent. So this card absolutely rocks. I play four of mandatory. There are so many lists that I've seen that run three and they've done well at a 95 person EU tournament or a 45 person Australia tournament. Um, and I'm glad that those people did well with it, but this card is so good, not only for all the effects I told you, but this is the card that with a TP you stack on top of your deck. And so when you swing with it, uh, if you can set it up properly, you're turning your three into a 29K swing. And especially going late game, uh, I won one of my games specifically against the first of three Trunks Zeno decks that I played, because as I'm pushing late game, I actually used uh, two of these off combo effects off the top on two different attacks. So for free, as I'm pushing for a game, for no energy at all, I threw down two different 10k combos on two different attacks to push my opponent and eventually killing them. And I think I won that game by five, maybe 10k. Like it was it was so close in a game that I honestly didn't think I was winning. 
But then back to back comboing these off the top for, for nothing was absolutely huge. So play four of because you want to be able to have one or two in hand to play yep. and one or two to go somehow into your Z energy. And you obviously get rid of them via the effect. So you need as many as possible because if you're forced to charge one early or you simply do not see them, it's going to feel bad and the deck's going to feel a lot worse. So play four. I promise you, you just can't go wrong that way. All right. The next card we have here, uh, two copies of Sin Shenron, Cold Hearted Shadow Dragon, an absolutely busted yellow card. Um, how did it work out this weekend? So believe it or not, I never played this card once. Oh. Uh, which is really weird because I know when our testing together, when uh, you were testing 21, this card comes up because, uh, well, that matchup is slower, right? I can't kill you immediately. And uh, you play a lot of good cards, but a lot of like singular good cards, your turns aren't wide. They're always kind of tall and big and impactful. So this is a good card to play in blue and slower matches where you're not expecting them to go wide at all. Uh, and for those who don't know, it's a counterplay. Uh, you can play for two if you have seven cards between your drop, energy, Z energy, and battle area. Um, it's a counterplay. When you use the counterplay to play it, uh, you get to draw a card and simply play it. Then it's auto is simply uh, if your opponent plays a card, um, I don't believe it is via skill. I think it's a card at all. You can choose to negate the skills of the card they just played and then restand this card. So this card is really good for matchups where they go not super high early if you can get this thing off as early as possible this is like a block their first attack if they play anything at all this is a um a restand for a second block but then offensively if you want to use this on their turn and especially on kill turns where your opponents normally like token negates are very prevalent so if they token negate though after you've already swung with this 24k body since they play a token which is a battle card this card will restand which means you could use it to block um twice the next turn or swing again and then uh on their turn if they decide if they play anything at all you do get to restand it for a single block so a lot of utility in this card it's just this deck does so much for two energy through its archetype that this never felt very good to play and i never played Ender 21 or any like long game besides golden frieza but again that one didn't matter because i know frieza also has uh access to barrier removal so overall this card is fine i just don't know if it's necessary you kind of run it to uh to cover your bases but overall not once did i play this card gotcha all right well next we have three uh four robotic reposts obviously really don't need to explain too much yep. you can search yeah, off your ahead. leader it's just good it's searchable it's snapped in this deck but everyone knows what it does so we'll go on to the next one yep we got one copy of the power of a super saiyan yep easy everyone knows what it does don't need to go over that one <laughs> right uh two freezes army reinforcements obviously it's good to always have like one or two copies of right. a uh, yeah. blocker negate yeah so this one i actually i was running at three um again because i want to pay my i want to use all my energy mainly to like kill you if i don't have to leave uh more than two energy up i don't want to obviously this is always used for free um normally uh this was actually i moved it down to two i think i could even get away with one i just don't need it all that often it's just not super necessary i just like having it in case of like a uh you know kind of a no shit button because you they dropped a cheesy quad striker or something out of nowhere and this is the only thing stopping you from uh losing so it's huge i don't think it's super necessary um so cut it down to two didn't actually end up playing it all that much but for the most part these extra cards were to fuel like repost and stuff like that um but two felt fine yeah, I wish I had one of these in, uh, during my pan matchup because that would have saved me. Exactly. <laughs> There's just too many keywords uh, that some cards have that, like, even, you know, some surprise doubles that are cheap, a lot of cheap double strikers out there. This just kind of saves you from time to time. Right. Next, we, of course, have three Krillin moments before yep. moments before comeback. Obviously, best yellow super combo. Your mm -hmm. secret rare you ran was Gohan and uh, Piccolo, a newfound right. might. Uh, Best, best secret rare for yellow right now, you think? I mean, I think it is. Uh, I think uh, for the most part in a deck like this that wants to kill you, like that does so much for different swings. Um, the best feeling in the world is, is on push turns where you go from like three to five to another five to an eight, back to three, back to a five. And you kind of do all your other shenanigans. In one of those, like while you're swapping through the chains, if you're able to stop at a one and swing the one, because the one is deflect barrier, right? If you're able to do that and then drop this super rare or secret rare, excuse me. So they're at like three, maybe two life. Um, and they go, you go swing one and they're like, uh, all right. Like if they, if they're not totally on top of this secret, secret rare being in your deck, they won't say they won't negate it or they won't block it because it's a four. But even if they do, you're like, sit, 
thank you for blocking my 4K. Now I'm gonna go into a three or a bigger card and now you have one less block, one less, less negate to stop it. So like, it's just such a good trick to go 4K swing and then you make it 34 and your opponent has to combo out. Yeah, um, that's dirty. Or I feel bad. Yeah, like this, it's just so good that way. I love swinging small bodies late game and your opponent gets really confused. And if they forget the secret rear exists, they feel so bad when slamming down. So <laughs> best secret rear in yellow, it's fantastic. Get it if you don't have it. All right, next we have two copies of Tyrannical Blow, an amazing counterplay. Yeah, really strong. Uh, every yellow deck needs to run a couple of them. It hits Repose Vegito counterplay in the mirror match. It hits uh, uh, basically most floodgates, battle card floodgates, so you just have to run them. Right. Then we have one Swift Retaliation Cooler, a card I will repeatedly say should be banned at this point, but... Uh, sure. <laughs> it, yeah, we uh, all know that opinion. Um, I never played this card once all day. Uh, it is a three-cost counter-counter, and I think that there are some yellow decks that are, like, really mid-range control, and then when they're ready to kill you, they'll have a really good established board, and then they, have, they don't have to pay any energy to, like, do anything before they cool it. So that's why, like, this card probably feels a lot better than a lot of other yellow decks. In this deck, if your opponent knows what you're doing, they try to, like, curtail your board. So when my kill turns happened, I usually did have to kind of build back a little bit of a board and use some energy to do that. So, like, I never felt good tapping three for cooler and then being like, yes, I'm going to kill you now. That's not how it happened. Uh, I never felt good in that situation when I saw it because um, that three energy can be used for, like, four or five attacks. Right. And I'd rather just like kind of push through a floodgate if it's not that bad of a floodgate and kill you through it than tapping three and losing so much more value in that way. So you have to run it as a yellow deck, but in this deck, I really never found myself playing it. Gotcha. All right, next we have one of your uh, Overwhelms, Secret Identity Massean, fresh off the ban list. Yeah, uh, this card rocks again um, because it is a uh, it is a up to uh, removal, which means that you can target tokens and stuff like that. And like, yeah, SS4 Vegito Dark Holy type thing is still a um, warp anything on play. But this can get rid of multiple cards, especially if your opponent has like a bunch of weenies, a bunch of one cost blockers and stuff like that. It just feels so good. You're going for a game. You force them to do like their first token negate and then you slam this down. And it just feels so bad because everyone wants to token negate with the idea that they block a second attack with one card. And this just says, no, sorry. So like if I swing my big A drop, double duel, and the first swing they token negate and I go, okay, stop it. And then I go back into a 30 double after that with they have to either negate or they just don't have anything. It feels very good. Right. And I believe, oh, no, we have uh, one copy of Metacooler Infinite Terror. I'm assuming this is just going to be your uh, counterattack, your free counterattack while you are Z-Awakened. Right, so I think if the next card is Sorbet, you can go ahead and, and pop that one as well. There's a Sorbet card here somewhere. We'll, we'll get into it, okay. So that's my other overwhelm. Real quick on Metacooler. Uh, yeah, so if you're a Z leader or have a Z battle card to play, this is a free negate. It's normally a two cost. It just simply says negate the attack to play this card. It does have a permanent that I believe it's bond to uh, this card against 5k barrier. So if you have any other battle card on the field, it is a 15k barrier, which, you know, is just nice to have a sticky body from then on after you negate it. This is actually one of two free negates. There's a sorbet we'll see just in a second that you can play for free to negate attack as a Z leader. So like there are some kill turns against decks like Trunks Jita that I'm surviving because I have literally two free negates that aren't token negates. Like that's absolutely fantastic in terms of survivability. So I, I you only need to see really just one or one of it by your late game. So one is fine. I run two of the sorbet, we'll see that later. Uh, going into the other overrealm, I feel good having a potential early game mid kind of turn uh, over around before secret ID. That's just a little bit more pressure. You know, if things kind of turn out where my opponent drew bad. I can tell they don't have a negate and I maybe see a little blood in the water. I'm not killing them, but an extra 20K swing that allows me to see two new cards and potentially throw a dead card into my drop to keep repose refueled or something like that um, feels really good. And again, 20K swing for, for nothing is still a fine thing so i like two different over realms uh one kind of lower right over on four and then the over on six to try to kind of end the game oh yeah absolutely i mean it's great so for it's easy it's since it's only over round four it's pretty quick to get out um and cycling is always appreciated in this game yep. uh, then we ran a single copy of time magic yeah time magic i think i have one of the the side as well uh this is just again a one of that you know, Trunk Zeno sure does have a dual attacker, and there's some really good dual attackers and cards that swing more than once. Zero's B Z battle, like I Beerus, excuse me, Z battle that I mentioned earlier is another one. 
uh, you know, if in the mirror match, if I did see it, I'd love to time magic their eight drop. Uh, just a lot of good cards that do have dual attack. So uh, to, to stop yourself from dying, time magic is still a very good card. Exactly. And then another one of, of uh, Vegeta's final flash, uh, amazing yep. activate battle, basically just blanking a card, ignoring barrier and giving yep, a 15 grade boost. Yep, it's just a gotcha card. So like I was waiting, there was a lot of matchups where I knew my opponent, you know, if they played a certain card um, that had, again, a dual attack or some crazy effect that happens when, or that it could swing a bunch of times, golden cooler, uh, secret rare, stuff like that. This is just such a gotcha card. And so um, it just helps you get out of a lot of sticky situations. Vegito, they swing triple strikers, right? If you have this um, and you don't have any negates, but an energy up and they're like gonna go all in on a potential triple per game and you just like flash it and take one of your two or three remaining life, uh, it can really get them. So yes, you gotta, you just have to have one because if you if they see it at all, even if you charge it, your opponent has to respect it. Absolutely. Uh, next, we have two copies of the Super Saiyan Vegito Overwhelming Might, basically just another uh, version of a robotic repost. Yep, it's just uh, a really good card. Um, this one, unlike Repost, is so leader cards can swing through this as unison cards can swing through Repost. So if you do one or the other during a turn, um, it's a real sh quick shutdown. You got to land both of them to each cost one, uh, but it does help you. And then there are some turns where if you run enough of these, so like I only run two, but you could like window one, window two of a boss monster being played via a skill. So like the, the Gohan boss monster, yeah, it has deflect, doesn't matter. This is just a counterplay to play it. And then if you play, you know, win the one, win the two of the boss monster, they can't swing that card unless they tap down two other cards, which means they're tapping their two other energy. They can't tap their uh, field card. They can't, uh, they're probably not wanting to tap their leader, which is at that point, probably a 20K double. And then they probably only have one other battle card on the field at the time. So in general, this just can help you out of some sticky situations. And it's a blocker that is warped at the end of the turn um but if they can't get rid of it on the spot this is um also another stop attack so not only do they have to rest mode a card after playing this they have to get through the barrier so like are you going to swing and rest something just to get blocked or you is that probably going to end your turn and it probably does the latter right uh finally well uh, second to last we have one copy of cold bloodlust um uh, a boogeyman card from set one yeah it's just your second secret rare um, the card is awesome. If you if you don't see your T blows, cold blood busted. Like it's just it feels so freaking good to use this card. My round one opponent was a blue Beerus, and they tapped six for Vegeta to ramp four, and I said no, and then I won the game immediately. It's just it is such a uh, I don't know, just a kill button in and of itself. To right, like that it is huge. Absolutely. All right, and the final card here is going to be two copies of Sorbet Devoted Support. Yeah, this card rocks as well. I mentioned it earlier. This is the other free negate that I get for having specifically the Frieza, this Frieza leader being a Z leader. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of kill turns where having Medical and Sorbet in hand at the same time is just, it just feels nuts, right? Especially then have a token negate. It's just insane. This deck's defensive enough. It's going to have, you know, um, a Repost. It's going to have a Fujito. But even on turns where, say, you're playing Black and they've got, you know, three life left, four life left, and they're trying to kill you. So every time you like Vegito um, or Repost, they go take the life Super Kamehameha, take the life Super Kamehameha. And so they keep stopping your floodgate. But then after you've spent two energy and uh, you've, you've still negated an attack um, with Repost, Vegito unfortunately didn't do anything because it didn't land. But then they're going to keep swinging. But like you have Sorbet for any of their big double or triples, you have Medical for the next one, you have a token for another. So like if you sequence this properly, it is so hard to get through. And then I forgot to mention it on the extra card, but the extra cards, extra effect, Return of the Army of Terror is that you can pitch it to be near leader for the turn. So plus 5K for the turn, which means that your 20K Z leader becomes a 25K Z leader. So not only are they trying to get through that, you have all these free negates. It's just really cool if you do see all this stuff together at the end of the game, it's really good. And then finally, it's, it's activate battle is for the turn, uh, buff a sweet freeze a wood swap by 5K. Best thing you can do with that is have it on board after you've negated with it, following turn, buff your eight cost to swing 35K base, uh, double duel, um, which is just fantastic. It never really came up, but just knowing that it's there is really cool. Right. Dang. Well, you know what? That is the main board. Uh, we did go into a little bit more detail specifically about the Frieza swap package because mm -hmm. anyone who is interested in playing the stack, you got to know, you know, how the deck works and 
Um, I'm really glad Mikey can you know, talk about how to play the Frieza Swap with the particular, uh, with the particular engine. Um, now we're just gonna go into the Z deck real quick. Uh, yeah. Two copies of the Golden Frieza Shining Emperor Z Awaken, mm -hmm. uh, being a 20K body. Uh, what does this do? Like, how does this help the deck? Yeah, so besides being a 20K, the thing about this one is uh, this only lasts actually until the end of your opponent's next turn. It costs three Z energy, which is a lot, but this deck obviously builds the energy quite a bit without having to like hemorrhage cards from uh, your hand to get there. It costs one yellow, you have to be at four or less life. Um, and then when you play it, you can Z stack one, a one cost uh, Frieza's army Z battle card underneath it. The only one that you actually do play is a Sorbet, which we'll see next because that one is played via being under it. There's a one cost Sorbet Z card, but that one actually does not get played uh, via its own skills under the Z leader. So you're only stacking Sorbet. So this card is auto. When this, when this leader card is placed in your leader area, you draw a card, solid. And then the second auto is snapped because it's not a once per turn. And it reads that similar to the Awakened Side Leader, whenever your five or more Frieza cards attack, you get to look it up to the top three and combo with one of those cards if it's a Frieza army. So every single time you swing, you get to do that. Meaning, if you have any 5Ks on board, you get at least one. If you play the five cost one against dual attacker, the barrier blocker, there's two times you get the combo on there. So your 20s become 25s. If you swing with the um, boss monster, you are a base 30. And then if you swing and hit, you're hitting uh, 35s. And then if you happen to hit another eight drop off of it, you're hitting uh, 40s. And then if you hit eights onto your 20s, right, you're hitting 30s. So like, you're just swinging so big. And if, the, if your opponent did not control your board prior to this kill turn when you play this, you are swinging a lot and you're swinging very big. So this is huge. Uh, the unfortunate part is that it does go away at the end of your opponent's turn. So you do get to be a 20 on the defensive side, but once that turns over and it's back to you, this card is removed from game. And so is the Sorbet if you didn't play it. Gotcha. Yep, we do have one copy of Sorbet, Emperor Subject. Yeah, this one is another kind of get out of jail button as well. So its effect is the first auto, which is re uh, remove two, excuse me, send two of your Z energy from your, uh, to the drop. If your opponent plays a battle card via a skill with a cost of seven or less, play this card from under your Z leader and rest the card. So I will say someone, someone brought up this uh, question at the, the tournament, which was if they counterplay Sorbet, does it stop the card from being uh, rest mode? And I, I would say that it does not because it's all one auto. There's no colon, right? There's no cost being paid besides two Z energy to your drop. So you play this out and rest the card. It is not, if you played this card, rest mode, the battle card being played, it is simply play it and rest mode the card. So that's awesome. That's uh, written very well. And then it's other auto is when this is played, search the top five for a um, Return of the Army of Terror extra card and add it to your hand. If you did drop another card from your hand uh, to this card area, uh, which is just kind of whatever. Uh, most of the time it's kind of whatever because you don't really see it because you've seen all of them already or there's only one left. Right. But if you do see it and you didn't have one, then this card gives you the extra bean card, right? So um, why I love this card is because especially against Trunk Zeno and Black decks, they play a lot of their stuff by skill and they're usually six or less because of Overrealms not being above six for the most part. And this is for non-Black decks, if your opponent's going in and say like, if they just land this next overrealm and swing, you just don't have like the combo power or whatever else because they've already done so much. This is your get out of jail button. They go overrealm thinking that they've got game wrapped up because you've got like one, maybe two cards in hand. And then, you know, sorry, Sorbet and then uh, rest them. And then you're probably saved. What's, what's like normally bad because it does cost you two Z energy, but in a scenario where you're comboing your hand out how to stop all these other attacks and not dying, you're going to get that 2Z energy for sure. And then whenever that final card is played, you play this card and, and stay alive. It's insane. Uh, as someone who's been on the uh, on the opposite side of this, yeah, card is nuts. Yeah, very right. good. A lot of people don't see it coming. All right, and then the last four we got, of course, Oolong, Greed is good. Just Oolong, everyone knows what it does. Yeah, it gets really big. Play the Seeker Rare. I, I honestly never played this, but uh, in a situation where, you know, I didn't see the right cards, but I had one energy left and a lot of Z energy, play Oolong, copy the biggest card. It's one more swing. Just use it that way. Yeah, easy. Uh, next, SS3 Vegeta, Terrifying Agent of Destruction. Very good yellow card. 
Very good yellow card. Uh, it's a 3-2, which is very expensive. I never played this either, but the thing is, it's just extra uh, Z or excuse me, barrier removal. This doesn't have to be in barrier in rest mode to KO it through barrier. So it's like better barrier removal, I guess, than the dual name, despite being one extra energy cost. Um, the upside is that if you did KO a card in rest mode, it gains critical and it's already a 20 duel. So this is something that can put on some pressure given the right situation. It's just a good utility card. Um, I think every yellow Z deck should have at least one. Oh, absolutely. And then of course we have one copy of SS Blue Goku Evolved Defender. Yep, uh, another card, just a one-up for the sake of having it. Good utility card. Again, in a, uh, a longer matchup where you look at the board and go, okay, well, I, I just don't think I'm gonna like do too much if I tap energy and try to kill you. Um, but instead you pay three and two to play this card out. Um, when it's played, you choose one of your opponent's battle cards or leader cards and it can't attack the next turn. And then its other auto is that when your opponent plays a battle card, just like at any point, not once per turn, but at any point, um, you get to rip a Z energy to, I think it's rest mode the card and then negate the skill for the turn if you used it. So your opponent can't proc it, you get to choose. Um, it's just one of those cards that like, if their next turn was just gonna be a leader swing and maybe a boss monster then plus another one, this helps you get through that turn without having to like pay a bunch of energy um, on the other side. Right. And finally, you got a single copy of SSB Vegeta surmounting the impossible because obviously it's just, it's surmounting the impossible. You always just want, you always want to run at least one. Yeah, for the most part, uh, that's how everyone looks at it. Uh, I actually didn't have this in my Z deck for a while. I ran one of the Togama uh, Z battle cards that came with the Frieza archetype because I just felt, you know, why not? It does some other things. That one also does also, uh, excuse me, that one also helps you self-awaken with one of its skills, but that's a one energy, three Z energy play that you're almost never doing because you need your Z energy for everything else that your deck wants to do. So I took it out and added surmounting. Um, specifically, I would have no trouble getting down to four or anything or five uh, for token negates and stuff like that naturally. But against decks like Expert 21, uh, New 21, and some some other matchups that really want to go long, this is how I awaken early. I just kind of ended up adding it because in some of the testing I did against Expert 21, they did not attack. So I am needing to get this down to five, down to four, um, and it's just helping me do just that. Awesome. And then finally, we'll just go over the side deck, which looks like, you know, already two cards are revealed. Uh, you add additional Tyrannical Blow, additional Time Magic. Yeah, we've you seen know. those two. We'll just make this fast. We'll yeah. go those fast. Chi-Chi, uh, Blue Silver Bullet against Ender 21. Play it on your kill turn so they can't de-magic, and hopefully it's a lot easier to win. There you go. Uh, two copies of Godless, uh, G Godly Destruction. Destruction. Weiss. Yeah, this one is for Golden Frieza. It, it makes them so if they want to untap energy via the leader skill, they have to like, I think it's burn a energy or something like that. Um, I played this against the one Golden Frieza I played. Um, he restood energy and then like made a second move after that. And then I stopped and was like, you restood energy, but because I didn't specifically stop him before he did a second action after we standing, I technically missed the opportunity and I couldn't like, you know, he just, I, I'm not saying he took advantage or anything like that, but I was too slow because I don't often find this against Frieza and play it. I don't need this against Golden Frieza, but I finally did it. Right. Like one moment I had to burn him in energy, I missed it and it's just my fault. So don't forget your triggers, but this is a good card against Golden Frieza because if they want to restand two or one, whichever side of the leader they're on, they're going to have to burn the energy and it usually will stop them from, from doing that entirely while it's on board. All right, there you go. Yep, always, always just don't let your opponent, you know, rush play sometimes. They gotta, you know, be yeah. smart about it. Uh, yeah. Then we have two copies of Mutaito, Scale of a Sage. Yeah, this one's, uh, this was a huge epiphany as we were heading to Madison. This was our, uh, our basically our bullet against Green Gohan. So either early on when they want to start the game by tucking Vegeta and Trunks under the time chamber, uh, hopefully if, you, if you're going second, or first, doesn't matter. You always want to leave one up before they're able to play the Vegeta. So if they do that, they play out Vegeta from Chamber and you tap one from Taito, you send Taito to the drop after it's played to rest the Vegeta, and then the Vegeta cannot swing, meaning that the Trunks card is stuck under their Chamber, they cannot combo it. And what that does is it takes Green Gohan completely off their curve for the turn, because the, the turn they play Vegeta, they combo Trunks, and then they swing again, combo Vegeta in rest mode, and then they tuck Gohan Goku and they continue on. Well, Mutaito stops them from doing just that. And um, so it means that the next turn, so on turn three, 
they have to use Chamber's ability to play out Trunks, and then on that turn, tuck go Gohan. But on turn three, normally the Gohan player wants to play Goku and play Gohan because that was the turn prior when they tucked him. So this definitely hurts them that way. It makes them play a lot longer of a game that they want to. They don't to kill you as fast. And then the secondary use against Gohan is obviously the boss monster. So the boss monster on swing is KO through a uh, barrier and then your opponent discards a card. Well, uh, and then there's the crit alive, obviously, but if they never swing, then uh, they can't do that. So Mutaito rest modes through barrier. So they play the boss monster, you play Mutaito, you send it to drop, boss monster's rest moded, they just pay two energy to play the boss monster and watch it sit with barrier in rest mode and then you kill it next turn. Gosh, smart move. Uh, next we have one Death Blaster, which is, you know, more counterplay stuff, which is insane. Yeah, this is just for Golden Cooler, SCR. Uh, I mean, it can hit other things, but mainly going in, it was Golden on their turn five, turn six. They think that they can slam Golden Cooler, um, rip my hand down to just five, and then swing 40K double a billion times. Um, I didn't actually get to use this um, against the one Golden Cooler player. I didn't end up needing it. Time actually had my back there. But uh, this just means that when they play the Golden Cooler, it's played with its skills negated. So it's a 40K beat stick. You don't get to restand. You don't rip their hand, anything like that. So this is the answer to Golden Cooler in those long games. Gotcha. Then we have, of course, Trunks the Cunning for the blue matchups. Just standard 21, new 21. You play one, they can't cease to spare and restand five. That's all that is. You just need to see the one. So there's the one. Then we got two flying Nimbus. I'm assuming for more uh, just stally, stally games. Yeah, like I, I talked about how all these counterplays are for battle card uh, floodgates. Like Green Gohan is eating good because their good floodgates are not only good, but they're extra card uh, uh, negate. So Golden Cooler, or excuse me, Cooler Counter Counter is the only thing that hits it. So instead of relying on Repost and Vegito to like be my my floodgates against you know aggro turns and stuff, the Nimbus felt so good. You just slap it down. Yeah, you ditch a card, but Freezer Swap keeps a decent sized hand, and you know their turn is coming to an end. So it just feels a lot better playing this than uh, honestly a lot of matchups with Repost and Vegito. This card just saved my butt quite a few times. Nice. And then of course two copies of Kotsukai because floodgate hate. Yeah, so uh, again, another reason to play Flying Nimbus was Koitz. Koitz is, this this meta is such a Koitsukai uh, time in the game because Repost, Vegito, Topo, Android 17, Defending Friends, like every good deck has a Floodgate that is a battle card. And then Token Negate, same thing. If you Koitz and they Token Negate, they're forced to uh, warp or discard two cards, whatever it is, because it's not an option to play the token. So Koitz is just so dang good. And the fact that Gohan can play this card seamlessly um, before going in is, is huge, and uh, it's just such a good card. It's going to be looked at as a potential banless candidate because of how much it does affect the meta. I can see that. And finally, two copies of Sun Gohan, trusted ally for uh, any hand destruction decks. Yeah, I only played one Gohan, and he played the Exodia package in it. Uh, I ended up using this as energy, and then my second one uh, to charge, to get out of an attack to do Z energy. Um, and I actually missed an opportunity to play it after he played a boss monster um, to try and uh, well, to make me pitch one, uh, which sucked. But like this card, I never resolved it. I only played the one Gohan. I never had it in hand to resolve. I still think you need to in this meta because Green Gohan exists and will exist until Bandai says it doesn't. Uh, so you have to play this, you have to play Devora, And this was just the, the decision I made to play two of them. Gotcha. All right. Well, that is the deck list. Um, like I said, we wanted to go into a little bit more uh, detail about how to play the Frieza Swap package because this mm -hmm. is still a new deck. Like you said, not a lot of people know about it. And hopefully after watching this video, a lot of people will want to give it a try themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but let's talk about your, uh, your matchups. It was seven rounds. Um, just what matches did you win? What matches did you lose? Uh, go. Yeah, so first round was against the Blue Bears ramp uh the guy said he hadn't been played in over a year um but i want to say he played i mean not super long but he called it a year so um still a good player uh you could tell he didn't know what my deck did and so i always made sure all my opponents they didn't know what my stuff did i made sure they they, they knew exactly what it did i wasn't trying to get anybody um if i want if they wanted to beat me i wanted them to beat me knowing exactly what they're getting themselves into so um, I took my time with him, but the killer there is that he did his normal beer stuff, 
And then he tapped six when he only had six energy for the Vegeta to ramp. And I just cold bloodlusted it. And then I killed him on the crack back, which uh, was not hard at all because obviously blue tapped out and he was already down to like, I think he had three or two life at that point. It was just really unfortunate. I don't think that that matchup's really crazy for this deck. I think Freeza Swap's heavily favored. He was a phenomenal person though. Great guy, shout out to him. Second round was against Egg, the Golden Frieza matchup. Set one, um, good guy. Uh, we played a very good game. The turn before the game was decided, um, I actually held up two for Death Blaster. He did not Golden Cooler with his five energy. And then we kind of got really close into time. And so they don't put the overtime on the clock. And I know they have their reasons. I think it's such a dumb decision not to, because like, I don't know how fast I need to play. And I think that's more important for a player to know than maybe a player being a scumbag and like seeing how much time is left in slow playing. You know what I'm saying? Like if there's people there to stop the slow play or you're on top of it, it shouldn't matter if they can see the clock because slow playing is simply slow playing. So I didn't know, I my final turn I felt rushed to kill him and to also give him a chance to win. So I was going fast. I ended up tapping out completely or down to one. So I didn't have the death blaster up for his golden cooler. Well, he I passed turn. I'm like, overtime's almost over. Let's just hope he doesn't have it or he can't kill me um, because I'm up in life. And then he does drop golden cooler. I clench up. I'm like, oh, this is it. But uh, he swings once and I go, no negates. I'm at three life, he's at two. And then he just goes 40. And I stare at it for a second and I go, uh, okay, I got a dump. And so I go super combo, duh, bottom deck draw two, super combo, bottom deck draw two. And then I draw into my secret rare, but before I even draw the secret rare, they call time. And so I we look down, I have more life than he does. So I end up winning and he gets bummed out. So he should have like, uh, what was it? He should have dumped on that one. And I'm like, well, I did draw my secret rare and I probably would have out him anyway. He was bummed out. He thinks he would have won. We kind of did the math. Even if he restood several more times, like and used all my Z energy to keep restanding, I actually had the combo power to get out. Um, so I really wasn't too worried about it. Time just wasn't in his favor and he was in a bad spot and I wasn't. So um, one there, third round, I played a Vegito. Uh, another great guy. I had a great time with all my people. Um, I ended up talking to them a lot, which kind of bit me in the back. Uh, at the end, it's kind of how I fumbled the bag, unfortunately, is I'm just too damn friendly, apparently. Um, but we're talking, we're playing, we have a great time. Um, overtime comes again. He goes into his big kill turn. Uh, we enter overtime. He doesn't win. Uh, I have just enough to get out of all of it. And then on my turn, I do a bunch of stuff. I'm swinging, swinging, swinging. Um, I think I'm at two life. He's at one. I He KVIPs. I'm trying to kill him. Um, at one point, I wanted to swing my 4K into his leader with like to combo on top of it. Um, but then KVIP killed my one drop. I'm an idiot for that. Uh, and then I go pass. And as I say pass to give him a chance to kill me, they call time and overtime. I win that way. Uh, you're going to feel bad either way, whether on your losing side or on the winning side, because if you're on the winning side, you feel like you screwed them over. Um, I like to believe no one really is trying to do that. It just happens. Uh, round four, I played Dave Frenzo uh, from Team Ultra Instinct. Phenomenal guy. I got to talk to him afterwards. Great player. This was like a true Yugi Mo Moto moment. Uh, heart of the cards is only how I won this game. Uh, Trunk Zeno, my first of three Trunk Zeno matchups. And... He uh, tried to kill me. I stopped it on my kill turn. I'm like, dude, I don't know how I'm gonna get through this, but I can't remember if he panned. I think he did pan. And then I'm trying to kill him through the pan. So I'm dumping two cards per turn. But as I'm swinging, I had back-to-back -back attacks where I comboed the 10K Frieza off the top. And I ended up winning by like five or 10K. And he was just like, yeah, dude, you got it. And I like was just shocked. I was absolutely shook that I won this game. But it just goes to show you, you know, like when this deck, when things just work out in your favor, um, it can do some crazy things. So I got lucky there, uh, but was four and oh. And that's when the bad stuff started to happen. Uh, round five, I played Armando, who went seven and oh undefeated in Swiss. Uh, my second uh, Trunk Zeno in a row. He played it a little bit differently. He plays a mid range tempo, sorta ish. Um, he'll give you cards early to keep his life high. He awakens because Trunk Zeno doesn't uh, pick down. So he's awakened with high life. And then, 
when he knows that he's not going to kill me, he slams down SS Bardock Overrealm that floodgates me the next turn uh, by only playing, or I can only swing one time with a battle card. And then the tempo is just off. I just, I couldn't move him down, but I have like less cards in hand now. And then he tries to kill me. And I, if I don't have another Repost or Vegito or whatever, I don't survive. Um, if he has four less life, he just super Kamehameha's and it's just kind of easy GG's from there. He's a good player, phenomenal player, uh, great guy. Shout out to him as well. Uh, that was my first loss. There just really wasn't too much I could do there. Um, round six was AC Castro, phenomenal guy, played Green Gohan, my only Green Gohan of the day, but he sided out 13 cards and put in the Exodia package. Now, he could not see the Exodia cards, so the game went long. And then on turns like four or five, and as we got super late into the game, I just literally did not see any of my three costs. I saw three three drop freezes the whole game. And then for the final two, three turn cycles, I just didn't see one. And so I literally would just, I couldn't play the game. I didn't draw because my leader didn't swap. I did not uh, kill him or try to kill him because I didn't have the cards to even attack with. I had ones and fives and eights. And so I just kind of watched him slowly kill me and rip my hand until the game was over. So it was like a good game, I guess, but um, it just sucked. I'd never had the RNG happen so bad that way. Um, and there just was only so much I could do. Uh, it was just is what it is. So uh, four and two at that point, my last opponent was a third trunk Zeno. At this point, I'm like thirsty as hell. I'm hungry. I need to go to the bathroom. I am just in the worst place. And he goes, oh, I got a bottle of water here. I got a bottle of, or I got a granola bar for you. So he's very nice. He's just giving me these things. And then, so I'm like, I'm eating and drinking before we even like start playing, before we start siding. And so I'm like, siding took a little bit because I, I just was struggling to figure out like six different cards to fit in and out. Um, Cause I had, I wanted to make some changes from the prior Trunceno games. And then the game goes, it's kind of close. I'm down at two life. He's at six when we get into overtime. And then overtime hits and he does a turn. He doesn't kill me and he goes past. And I have to pick this guy down to one life or, excuse me, he's at, yeah. I have to pick this guy down to one life so I can win by life total if they call time. I start going to town. I'm sequencing, I'm throwing everything at him. He's taking life after life after life. He gets down to two life. I have everything in the world to push his face. In. He is done for. Yeah. If I pick up my one drop Frieza, which I just played and then turned it sideways, I slam the SCR, I slam everything I have to do a damage. And if he somehow doesn't do a damage, I play uh, the SCR, which gives me more battle cards and I win. It's as simple as that. I go five, two, easy, top 16, um, everything's great. But literally because I didn't put it sideways before they call time, I just lose. And so that's just tough, man. Like it sucks. It's my fault. I didn't play faster. I'm four and three because I didn't play fast enough. It's as simple as that. I have, you got to keep it tight on the time you spend eating and drinking and doing stuff between rounds. And especially if you're just, uh, if you're playing a slower deck and you're not the super fastest player like me, it'll cost you. And it just did this turn. I loved all my opponents. Everybody was great, but that's kind of how it went. Uh, I believe it should have been better hundred percent, but it's just how it went. Four, three, 28th place, unfortunate, but it is what it is. Yeah. You know what? That, that is how it is. You know, like I can look back at my matches and realize like, I think I could have gone five and two for my final match, but, um, but is, that is how it is. And, uh, you know, we just, we take what we, we learn from our mistakes and we just do better next time. That's just, yeah, that's all it is. It was a great time. I had an absolute fun, uh, blast while in Madison, love meeting everybody. Uh, just wish it went better, but that's on me. All right. Well, you know what? This video is already probably one of the longer videos I've done recently. So we'll end it there. Uh, once again, thank you, Mike, for coming on, showing off your deck and, uh, you know, letting people know how the basics of playing Frieza Swap. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if more people started playing Frieza Swap in the next up, uh, in the next upcoming tournaments, because it is it's really good. And it, I think people are just not willing to give it a shot because Green Gohan exists. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's a solid deck. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I hope more people play it. It's phenomenal. Um, give it a shot. All right. Well, uh, thank you guys so much for getting to the end of this video. Hopefully you didn't just like scroll all the way through it and then uh, get to the very end because you know what? Mike put a lot of hard, uh, hard work into this and explaining all of it. So you, you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't watch the whole video.
Yeah, very much so. Um, but once again, thank you guys so much for watching this. Uh, hit that subscribe button. We are now on our way to 500 subs now that we've crossed the 400 mark. And uh, thank you guys for everything. Uh, let us know what you think of this deck in the comments down below, and we'll see you on the next video. Take care.